Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word, which is the truth, and we receive it this night, written in our heart and mind. Thank you for bringing revelation. Thank you that we'll be doers of the word so that we meet all your conditions, so that we will not see the judgment that will come on the church affect us. Father, we thank you for all that you bring forth this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you on the subject of the judgment that is going to come on the church and the revelation of this in the book of Revelations chapter 2 and chapter 3. Remember that judgment comes first to the church before it comes to the world and that is shown in Revelation 2 and 3 before we see the judgments that come following that upon the world. And we began looking at this and we talked about uh, the beginning of the first two of the seven churches Remember, the Lord is walking in all the midst of all the churches. It's not only churches that were existing at that time, but also it's significant of each one representing a church age throughout, and it really speaks of Him walking in all the churches. He wants us to make sure, make sure that we are walking in the ways of the Lord. He brought the correction to those and told them what they needed to do to conquer and walk in the ways of the Lord. We're going to pick up with the third church, that's Pergamos, where there was tremendous idolatry. In Pergamos, there were all these idolatrous temples to all kinds of false gods. There was an idol devoted city, very wicked, and it was the religious center of idolatry in that day. It was a place where, unfortunately, the people turned away from the truth, and it was called Satan's seat, as you will see. We see in Revelation 2, 12, the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works. Remember, that's the first thing that he said to every single one of them. And this word here is in the perfect tense, indicating that he has known, have, I have known thy works, past tense, and he knows them presently. He knows all the works of anybody who has been a born-again believer. And he goes on, he says, Where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. It was a terrible place. Tremendous persecution was coming against him because of the preaching of the gospel in the face of this religious center of idolatry that was established in this particular city. It was the devil's seat, as it says. Speaks of those who hold fast his name and have not denied my faith. God never wants us to deny him. You know, the Bible even speaks of those in 2 Timothy chapter 3, in the last days where it says in verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous time shall come. And we certainly are moving down that little, little by little. He speaks about how men will be lovers of their own selves and covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And we see this among many today, not only in the world, but also in the church, because this is talking about people in the church having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. We cannot deny the power of God. We cannot deny the way of the Lord. We cannot de deny the faith. He talks about these guys. These guys did not deny the faith, even in the midst of all the persecution. Yet there's those, that, even today, that have a form of godliness. Don't ever let you have a form of godliness and deny the power of God. Anybody that's like that, the Bible tells us, turn away from them. What are we supposed to be denying? Well, God wants us to deny the things that are not of Him. Titus chapter 2, verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world, which really means present age. That's the way we're to live. We cannot have anything to do with any ungodliness or worldly lust. We need to deny those things and not deny anything that's of the Lord. Well, we see in 2 Timothy chapter 2, the statement. He says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, 
he also will deny us. We cannot deny him. If we deny him, he would deny us. That's why he was commending them, saying, you haven't denied the faith in the midst of all this terrible persecution that was coming at them. Never deny the Lord in any aspect, because however you treat him remembers the way he treats you. You deny him, he would deny us. Titus chapter 1, verse 16. It says, they profess that they know God. This is what some Christians do. But in works, they deny Him. Remember, our works show forth our faith. Our works show forth whether we truly repented. Our works show forth our walk. Our works show forth whether we're following the Lord. In works, they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and unto every good work, they were reprobate, or not standing the test, this word means. They were not approved of the Lord. God wants us to make sure that we never deny Him, but we walk in the ways of the Lord. As we see in Revelation 2, we come back here to the next verse, and he says, I have a few things against thee. Even though this church did not deny the faith and they were fighting against this persecution, they had some problems. A few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Remember, Balak was trying to get Balaam to curse Israel, and he couldn't do it. But, and he offered him money. Well, he wanted the money. He was covetous. He wanted the big reward of the finances. And so, because he couldn't curse them, he found another way to do it, which was to tell them if they would eat, if to get the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit fornication. So they sent the Moabite women over to them and get them to involve in fornication. Then curses would come upon them. That's what happened. And they ended up getting cursed, which was wrong. He did this all because of the fact that he was covetous. And then he goes on and says, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. The Nicolaitans were those who were also teaching the people to compromise. They were the teaching the people it was also okay to be involved in fornication and offer, offer up these things that idols, eat things, sacrifice to idols. They were teaching them compromise in order to be able to get jobs and get accepted and, and to be able to make their way in the midst of the situation. That's a mistake. False doctrines were going forth. He says, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them, the ones that have these false doctrines, with the sword of my mouth. And then we come down for a moment, we're going to jump down to verse 20, where he talks about Jezebel. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest the woman, that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophet, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication, to eat things, sacrifice unto idols. They did the same thing. Otherwise... This is in the church Thyatira. There was tremendous compromise in Pergamos and Thyatira because of the persecution that came. And what was happening in Thyatira, which is what this one's talking about, this is a place where there were trade unions. It was the center of the trade unions. And in order to get jobs, you had to join a trade, trade union. Well, if you joined a trade union, you had to participate in what they were doing, which again was involved in idolatry and committing fornications and their tremendous revelry, revelry and their parties and all their evil actions that they were doing. So they were teaching them that it was okay to do this because they had to have a job. No. You cannot compromise the things of God for anything. And, of course, he comes down to verse 24 and he says, I say unto you, I say, and to the rest of Thyatira, as many of us have not this doctrine, Otherwise, they were teaching false doctrines. Here we got these guys, the, got te the doctrine of Balaam being taught. We got, the, the, the says here, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans being taught. And now we got the doctrine of Jezebel being taught in these churches. Compromise. And now this is a problem. That speaks of the fact that doctrine is important unto God. Doctrine is very important because as we see, Verse 16, what did he say he was going to do? Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And then down in verse 22, he said what he's going to do to Jezebel. I'll cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. 
This shows you that this is talking about end time church, of course, because great tribulation hasn't come yet. And it shows you this is the judgment right before the great tribulation comes, because he's talking about cast her into this, which means it hadn't come yet, because the judgment comes on the church first. Except they repent of their deeds. And then he goes on and says, I'll kill their children with death, the children are the ones who are following them. And all the churches shall know that I am he that searches the reins and hearts, and I'll give unto every one of you according to your works. Our doctrine is important because your doctrine is going to determine your works, the things that you believe, the things that you have received and you believe on in your mind will shape what you do. Doctrine is important. You and I must have the true doctrine of the Lord. This is quite a subject that's addressed in the Word of God in the New Testament. Matthew 15, verse 9, In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Anything that's contrary to the Word is a commandment of men. It might seem like a good thing, but nonetheless, it's a commandment of men if it's contrary to the Word. You can never judge it any way except by the Word. If it's not in line with the Word, it's a commandment of men. It has not come from the Lord whatsoever. In fact, they were warned about those ones who were the religious leaders of the day. We have the same problem today. A lot of religious-minded people out there, talking about people that are pastors and, and teachers and so forth, are not teaching accurate, unfortunately. Verse 12 of Matthew 16, They understood how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of the bre of bread, but the, the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were the leading religious people of the day. We have to beware of doctrines of those that are, that are notable Christian leaders today because there's tremendous false teaching that has gone forth, unfortunately. That's why we've got to be good Bereans and check everything out to see whether it is in line with the Word of God or not. Look what it says about the importance of doctrine here in Colossians chapter 2, verse 22. Which all are to perish... They perish with the using. Using of what? After the commandments and doctrines of men. We can't follow the commandments and doctrines of men. We're not following the Lord. It says these guys perish with the using of these things because they were following false doctrines. In fact, look where these guys got to. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They didn't want to hear the sound doctrine of the word anymore. But after their own lusts will they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They wanted to hear some new great revelation. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, from the word, and shall be turned unto fables. Fables are fiction. Fables are those things that are, that are anything contrary to the word of God. And we see this very thing happening today. People follow things that are contrary to the Word of God instead of following the truth. We cannot allow this to happen. Remember, as we see in 1 Timothy chapter 4, the Spirit speaks expressly in the latter times, again, that's talking about now, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's quite a statement. This is not that he's got some wrong doctrine. It, it says they depart from the faith giving heed to these doctrines of devils and seducing spirits. That's pretty severe. You've got to walk in line with the word, otherwise you actually have departed from the faith. You can't be in the faith and be following doctrines that are false. No way. We have to, doctrine is important unto the Lord. In fact, we even see that one of the purposes of the fivefold ministry in Ephesians chapter 4, where it talks about the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, what's their purpose? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the precise, correct knowledge of the Son of God to the perfect man. We're going to grow up to the perfect man, which is the fullness, as it says, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, which will come forth in the end time church before he comes back. And then he says that we henceforth be no more children. Why can't we grow up to the perfect man and come to the fullness of Christ? 
and the unity of the faith and precise correct knowledge of the Son of, Man, of, of God to bring this to pass because of false doctrines, that we be henceforth no more children, which are nepios, spiritually infants, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, all these different doctrines. Look at the body of Christ today, all these different doctrines on so many different subjects. What a mess. That causes the people to be like spiritual infants because they are not established in the truth of the Word of God. God does not want us to have these things whatsoever. In fact, they were strong on doctrine in the time of the New Testament. 1 Timothy 1.3 As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. They were after them. Don't you be teaching anything else contrary to the doctrine of the Word of God that we have brought forth. You can't be teaching things that are contrary to that. You have to be straightforward on it. We've had to deal with people in the past that wouldn't teach correctly. They taught false things and wouldn't receive correction. You, we can't be in fellowship with them whatsoever if they won't repent. 1 Timothy 4.16 Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself. Notice, this has to do with you seeing the salvation of the Lord yourself. Thyself and them that are hearing you. The ones that you're preaching to. Because they're going to have to hearken to it present tense, of course, ongoing action, and to see the salvation of the Lord come forth in their life. So we've got to continue in the true doctrine. Of, that produces the salvation of the Lord as we're working out our salvation. He also got after them and said, 1 Timothy 6, verse 3, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, what words? Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. If they're not in line with the New Testament, law of Christ in line with what's the New Testament and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. If anybody teaches anything otherwise, he says he's proud, he's knowing nothing, doting about questions, strife of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men, a corrupt com minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Anybody that's teaching things contrary to the word, he says, withdraw yourself. He didn't want us to have anything to do with them. We also see the same thing, really, spoken in, the, in Romans. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, speaking to the church, mark them that cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned. And what are you supposed to do? Avoid them. You should not be around them. If they're not teaching correct doctrine, the Bible says to avoid them. In fact, we're even told, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which you received of us, which would be the doctrine of the Lord. Hey, if they're not walking right, you don't have anything to do with them. You withdraw yourselves. That is not being cruel, that is being wise, following the Lord and not letting yourself be contaminated by people that will be teaching you false things. 2 Thessalonians 3.14, If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, mark that man, have no company with him that he may be ashamed. That means you don't have fellowship with him. Can we have fellowship with people that aren't walking right? No. Well, that's the way it is. In fact, this, this is quite a statement down here in 2 John, verse 9. Look what he says. Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ, if he's not abiding in it, he hath not God. That's quite a statement. You could be born again, walking in sin, not abiding in the true doctrine of Christ, and from what he says is you are not having God. This is a present tense verb meaning you're not having God. You may think you are, but you're not. You can only have God if you're walking, you know, not walking in sin, you're not transgressing, and also you're abiding in the true doctrine. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, 
He has both the Father and the Son. He's got a relationship established with Him. This is why abiding, remaining, continuing, this is the Greek word meno, which means to continue or abide or remain or dwell in. Present tense, continuous repeated action, has both the Father and the Son. And he said, even says, if there, any, if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. You can't have these kind of people coming in your house. You are not going to let this affect you. God wants us to take a stand for what is right. And you can't be deceived by false doctrines out there. You've got to make sure whatever you're doing is in line with the Word. Revelation 2.16, remember, or 2.15, he talked about how, the, how those ones who are holding this doctrines, which things I hate. That tells you something. God hates things. And you know, he wants us to hate the things that he hates. We should hate things just like he hates things. In fact, we even see it used back in verse 6. The deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. He hated their deeds and he hated their doctrine. God wants us to hate the things that he hates. If you hate something enough, you won't be involved in doing any evil things in your life that are contrary to the word. Psalms 26, verse 5. Look what God says. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. That's the congregation. That's the assembly. That's, that's the people that are coming together like they're supposedly coming for the Lord, but they're not, they're not walking right. They're wicked. They're evildoers. We should have nothing to do with them. He hates that. Look what else he says. Anything that would cause you or anybody to turn aside you should hate it. Psalms 103, 1 verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave unto me. It's okay to hate the work of those that are not walking in the ways of the Lord, that are turning you aside or trying to turn people away from the truth. We should have nothing to do with them whatsoever. We do have to take a stand. Many Christians will not take a stand. They're going to be in trouble. Psalms 119, verse 104. Through thy precepts I get understanding. When you get understanding, then what? Now you know the way to walk in. And what's going to also be the result? Therefore, I hate every false way. <laughs> I want to have nothing to do with anything. Once I find out it's a false way, that's it. I'm done with it. I'm only going to walk in the true way. You want to have nothing to do with it. And then he speaks us again in this chapter in verse 128. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. Everything God says is right. And I hate every false way. God wants you to hate every false way. He wants you to love the things that are right. We can't be in compromise. If you're in compromise, you're going to be in trouble. God is going to reward those that are taking the stand for what is right. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9. Look what Jesus says about Jesus here. Because this is Jesus after he was exalted in heaven, given and enthroned with a scepter of righteousness, a scepter of his kingdom. And here's the statement about him. Thou hast loved righteousness. He wants you to love what is righteous. Thou hast hated iniquity, which is anomia, which is lawlessness. He hates lawlessness. You need to hate lawlessness. Remember, because people, unfortunately, in the end will not hate lawlessness. What's going to happen to them? They're going to be in trouble. They're going to be part of the fallaway group. Matthew 24, 12, because lawlessness, same word, shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. That should never happen. Your love for God should be always hot. It should always be strong and never diminish in any way whatsoever. Because, because of the people who are walking contrary to the way and not following the way of the Lord. We must take a stand for what's right. C people that compromise will be judged. They're going to be in trouble. All these ones that compromise their doctrine back there so that they could get a job or get whatever they needed, they were judged. You can't do that. You're going to be in trouble. Then we come to... <laughs> Well, we didn't finish the rest of this one. 
He says in verse 17, He that hath an ear, let him hear. Or remember, this word actually is the commanding statement. It's not let him hear. It's an imperative mood. It literally says, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We're supposed to hear. And to him that overcometh, which conquers and carries off the victory, will I give to eat of the hidden man, and I'll give him a white stone, and the stone a new name written, which we're all going to get, which no man knoweth saving he that receiveth it. The only ones who are going to be able to receive it are the ones that have conquered and overcome and carried off the victory. Then he comes on, he says, Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know thy works. Again, our works are so important. And then he also speaks of the charity, which is the love. Gape. God wants us to have love. Love for God and love for one another. John chapter 13, remember what he says in verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love, agape love, one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. We're to love people just like Jesus loved us. And he goes on and says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one to another. That's mandatory. You cannot be going around walking contrary to love. We must walk in love, be obedient to what the Word says. And we're to love Him as well. Remember, what shows that we love the Lord? John 14, 15, He says, If you love me, keep my commandments. That shows it. Verse 21, He that has my commandments, because they've heard the Word, they got the Word in their heart and mind, and keepeth them, they're holding fast to them because they're doing them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. See, he loves those who love him. You love him, he'll lo he loves you back. And I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said, If a man love me, he will keep my words. In the measure that you keep the word is the measure that you love God. Not just because you have an attitude or a good attitude towards God. It has nothing to do with it. It's all in evidence by what we keep my Father will love him, and we will come unto and make our abode with him. It means God's going to manifest himself unto those that will keep his words and will truly love him. And that is what he wants. We are to walk in love towards him and walk in love towards everybody. John 15, 17. These things I command you, that you love one another. It is a command unto every single one of us. There's no justification for you to ever move outside of the law of love. James 2.8 If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. That's the royal law. That's the law of kings. Well, you and I are kings. and We are to walk after this high law of loving one another. And the agape love is the love that realizes the valuableness, the preciousness, and the great worth of an individual. How everybody is so important. And how you should always Love one as you would love yourself. There's never any justification. In fact, that's the only way you're going to go on into perfection in your life. Colossians 3.14 says, Above all these things, put on charity, which is agape, love, which is the bond of perfectness for you to go on into be perfected in the Lord. In fact, in the church, praying for the church in Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. In the midst of that prayer, he said that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith and that you're to be rooted and grounded in love. That's what he wants. Rooted in it. You're fixed in it. You're grounded, which means that's the foundation. You do everything outside, outside of love. There's something wrong. First Thessalonians chapter 3. He even talks about how those ones are going to have a heart that's right before the Lord. Verse 12, he says, The Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all, even as we do toward you, to everybody. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. Can we ever come to the place of having our heart unblameable in holiness if we don't operate in love at all times? No, it'll never happen. Even our Father, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. God wants every one of us to make the decision to walk in love. And remember, when we walk in love, 
We love everybody. That includes your enemies. John 5, verse 44, remember Jesus said this, This I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. That means you never retaliate. You always give out to people what they have need of, not what they deserve, otherwise you make yourself a judge. We cannot be doing that. God wants us to walk in love at all times. That is absolutely necessary. These things need to be incorporated into us because this is the way he's going to judge the church. He's going to look and say, hey, are you meeting these conditions? He talks about the works, the charity in Revelation 2.19, but he also talks about their service which is their ministry. God wants you to be a servant, one who is ministering, doing the things that he wants you to do. Every single one of us are born from above. And what are we now? The Bible says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, down in verse 20, that we're now ambassadors for Christ. You're sent from heaven to here, and you're ambassadors for Christ, and you're to see for people, do you want to see people be reconciled unto God? He goes back into verse 18 and he says, All things are of God, which hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us what? The ministry of reconciliation, the service, same word, of reconciliation. This is part of your serving God, is reaching people to see them being reconciled unto God when they get born again to wit or to know that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing or charging their trespasses unto them. Make sure that when you share the gospel with others, that you're telling them that they, the good news, that Jesus Christ was God in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, and that he was not charging their trespasses against them, which means you're not charging anybody's sins against them. There's only one sin that they're convicted of, and it's the sin of not believing on Jesus. Otherwise, you don't have them confess their sins. Instead, you have them receive Jesus. That's the only sin. He's committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You get to speak the word that's going to bring the reconciliation, which really means the great exchange. Exchange of what? exchange of the old, the spirit that you've had, which was under Satan's dominion, and get a new spirit, which is the spirit of Jesus Christ. Get rid of this thing and get the new spirit on the inside of you. That is what he wants to bring forth in your life. So you and I are ambassadors for Christ. We need to be preaching the gospel. Remember what the Bible says, Mark 16, if you're going to be serving the Lord, you're going to carry out the ministry of the Lord. He said unto them, go in all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. They need to hear the gospel. And what's the gospel? It's good news. It's not condemnation. It's not negativism. It's not, you've got to turn from your sins. No, it has nothing to do with that. It's the good news of what Jesus Christ has done. In fact, it's important for you to understand that Jesus is only, the Holy Spirit operating is only convicting people of one sin. It talks about, here's the Holy Spirit, when he comes he reproves the world of sin, singular, of righteousness and of judgment. Otherwise, you've got to deal with this sin so you can come to the place of being born again and then as you walk in line with the Word, you will be righteous. You get a righteous spirit and then you continue to walk in the Word, it will produce righteousness. And then, at the end, there's going to be a judgment, depending upon, you know, whether or not you're walking right. And of course, when he talks about the sin, it's one sin, the sin of not believing on Jesus. And the fact that he's the righteous one in the way to, you're going to become righteous. Because of righteous, because he's gone to the Father, you see me no more. He is the righteous one. He is the only way that you can follow after from that point on. And judgment, because the prince of this world is judged, or more literally, has been judged, a perfect tense. Meaning, if he's been judged with his, what's going to happen to him, everybody that's under him is under his judgment. Which means everybody that's not born again is under Satan's judgment. They're in trouble. That's why they need to come to the place of receiving Jesus. Well, we need to preach the gospel, and we need to preach it, the good news to them, and 
help them to understand that they need to receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. This ministry you have is a ministry that now is of the Spirit. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8, if we go back for a moment, he said, if the ministration of death, that was the Old Testament, written and graven in stones was glorious because it could not produce new birth. It could only brought the knowledge of sin. So that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For that's the New Testament ministry. It is of the Spirit. For if the ministry, ministration of condemnation, the Old Testament, be glory, how much more the ministration of righteousness, which is of the Spirit, exceed in glory. So we're going to minister the things of the Spirit and the things of righteousness to people to see them come to the place of being born again and walking in the ways of the Lord. Now, that's a more glorious gospel that is going to manifest mightily. God wants you to understand that you have a ministry, and it is glorious. You've got to do it right, in line, in the way of the Spirit, not in the flesh. It's got to be according to righteousness, not according to your opinions or commandments or doctrines of men. It's got to be right. Colossians 4.17, he said to our Kippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord and fulfill it. This is the same word, diaconia, service. You and I have the service. He says, I know your service. Well, God knows our service. Are we taking hold of the things that he's told us to do and going forth to minister for the Lord, to preach the gospel? doing the things that he wants us to do. In fact, Tim and Paul's speaking here in 1 Timothy 1.12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. God is looking for faithful people that he can trust, that then he can really put into a ministry to, in order to carry out the things that he has for you to do. And then it comes down to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 5, watch in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of the evangelist, and make full proof of thy ministry. There should be proof of your service of the Lord. We are to serve Him. We are to carry out the gospel. We're going to minister to people. We're going to cast out demons. We're going to minister healing. We're going to encourage them. We're going to give them the word. We're going to pray for them. All aspects of ministering in different ways, it's always going to be in the Spirit according to righteousness. What else did he say then back in, in Revelation chapter 2? These are the things he knew, so these are things that were important to God. He just went, didn't remark these just to carry on a conversation. He knew their love is important, your service, your ministry is important, and also your faith is important. Your faith. God has given you the faith of Jesus Christ. And you and I must understand we got the faith of Jesus, and he wants us to operate according to that because everything you're going to do is going to be with your faith. Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. That's the new you on the inside of you. The life which I now live in the flesh, in this physical body, which is sin dwelling in it. I live by the faith of the Son of God because you have a new spirit. You have a spirit of faith. That's what you're going to live by. That's the faith, not your faith, but the faith of the Son of God, which is your faith, because you have the Spirit of Christ, not your spirit, but it's the Spirit of Christ that He's given unto you. So we have the Spirit of Christ, the Son of God. We have the faith of the Son of God that we can accomplish everything that He wants us to do. Remember, this is a spirit of faith. 2 Corinthians 4. Verse 13, remember everything we do now in the New Testament is in the Spirit. We having the same Spirit of faith, according as written, I believe, therefore have I spoken. We believe and therefore speak. We believe God's Word and we speak. What does speaking do? Releases our faith. Puts it in operation. Whether you're praying, whether you're commanding, whether you're speaking to a mountain, whether you're praying a prayer of faith, whatever it might be, you're going to put your mouth in operation. When you do so, you are putting your faith in operation. This is why we've got to get our faith developed. 
you have a general spirit of faith, but you need to get specific faith. How do you get specific faith? By hearing the word. Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When you get specific faith, does that mean that your faith is strong? No. Your faith has to grow. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. We're bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as meet, because your faith groweth exceedingly. It's going to grow. Well, how is it going to grow and become strong? Because of you applying the word in your life. We see over in James, these guys were to work their faith. James chapter 2, verse 20. Wilt thou know, O vain man, or devoid of truth, that faith without works is dead? What is faith? Why do we need works of faith? Because that's what causes your faith to grow, to become strong. That causes your faith to come to perfection. That causes your faith to come to the place of you being shown to be righteous before the Lord. We can see that here. Verse 22, Seeing thou how faith wrought with his works, by faith, by works was faith made perfect. It went, came to perfection, to completion, to see the results. And then, verse 24, you see then how by works a man is justified, which means rendered righteous or declared righteous, not by faith only, meaning your works of faith is involved in you being declared righteous because you're operating in faith. It's not just a believing thing. It's a carrying out of the Word of God and doing what the Word says. See, God wants your faith to grow. He wants it to become strong. Well, the disciples saw that, and they said in Luke chapter 17, verse 5, the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. How can your faith become strong? You've got to work it. Well, how do I do this? By putting your mouth in operation. The Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. What's the saying got to do with it? That's how you put your faith in operation. You believe, then you speak. You say words. Put your mouth in operation to speak forth the things of the Word of God in order to have your faith in operation, not only to move a mountain or to move a, something out of the way or cast out demons or take hold of promises, but this is also going to cause your faith to grow and develop. And this is of necessity because in Hebrews chapter 4, quite a statement, he says, Let us therefore fear the fear of God, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. What are we not to come short of? We're not to come short of entering into his rest. How do we enter into his rest? By possessing the promises. Because if the promises are left us of entering into his rest, it means we're not entering into his rest. And we would come short of entering into the rest because we didn't possess the promises. Possessing the promises is how you enter into his rest. How do I possess the promises? For unto us the gospel was preached. Remember, that word would produce faith in your heart, as well as unto them. But the word preached didn't profit them. Just because it produced faith in your heart doesn't mean it profited you yet. Why? Because you've got to do something with the word that came into you that produced faith. You've got to mix the word that you heard with your general spirit of faith. Not being mixed with faith, general spirit of faith it's talking about, in them that heard it. Because what do you do? You do what the Word says, or you speak the Word, you act upon it in some way, you work your faith, you put it into operation. That is how you see your faith develop. And that's exactly what God wants to come forth in your life. In fact, He prayed for the church in Thessal Thessalonians, in 2 Thessalonians chapter, or chapter 1, that is, in verse 11, in that prayer he was praying for them, that we pray always for you, that God would count you worthy of the calling, fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness, and the work of faith with power. God wants you to do, have the work of faith with power. Power comes from the word. The work of faith is accomplished as you speak and or do the word. And as you are releasing the power, the power of God is going to accomplish great work. You're, you're supposed to get full of all these things, see? God wants you to understand, through the Word in you, 
and through the faith that you have, as you put it in operation, you are going to develop greatly. He talks about, in Acts 6-5, the man who was full, these guys that were full of faith, as well as the Holy Ghost. And it also talks about Stephen, full of faith and power. We want the work of faith with powers. If we get full of faith and full of power, the work of faith with power will be mightily manifest in you and me. And that's what he wants, because there is going to be a mighty end-time church that is going to be raised up in these last days. And remember, all the things that happen in the book of Acts, in the beginning, they're going to replay again in the end-time church, where the glory is going to be greater. Then he speaks about the patience. We've already talked about this in the past, steadfastness. Steadfastness on the Word, steadfastness in the soulish realm. Steadfastness, remember, is uh, uh, where you're consistently doing the Word to conquer temptation. We already covered that in one of the previous sessions, and we also talked about works, and the last to be more than the first. So these things are all important to God if you are going to pass the test so you won't see the judgment. Then he comes along and says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which call herself a prophetess. Notice, here's one who's calling her something. Was she? No. She was deceived. We find a lot of people in the body of Christ want to call themselves something. Don't call yourself something if you're not really the real deal. We can only call ourselves something if God has truly called us to that and equipped us and given us that. In this case, it would be a ministry gift. We see a lot of people. I've been in churches before where everybody's got a, some kind of title, you know? Apostle so, prophet so, so, evangelist so, so, minister so, so, teacher so, so, you know, whatever all. Wait a minute. <laughs> all these guys, do they really have a ministry gift of these stuff? No, everybody has to have some title, I guess, so they all feel like they're important. It's a bunch of pride. It's not of the Lord whatsoever. It's ridiculous. You don't, you know, they call themselves so and so and so. They want to be called by their title, too. <laughs> Well, that's kind of a bit puff, puffing me up, huh? Who cares? If, you don't need to be called by a title. That's why I never introduce myself as by a title. I, only, I just say who my name is, you know? Just, just, that's the way they dealt with things. Think about it. Did they ever address anybody by a title in the New Testament anywhere? No. They only talked them by their name. They called them Stephen. They called them Paul. They called them Peter. They called them whatever their name was. That's the way we address people. Not all this other stuff. It's all a bunch of pride. Religious pride that gets a hold. Well, she thinks she's a prophetess. Oh, I'm a prophetess. Everybody should listen to me. If people start thinking there's something, oh, that means you must have some credentials with God, so I guess I should listen to you. And they weren't even checking things out in line with the word. What a mess. He was teaching and seducing my servants to commit fornication, to eat things that were sacrificed unto idols. Well, that was a mistake. Was that what they were supposed to be doing? No, that has already been covered long ago. Back in Acts. In Acts chapter 15, they'd already covered this deal. For as much we've heard, certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised, keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment whatsoever. They, they were tell, correcting these guys. And they'd already come back here, and they said in verse 20, We write unto them that they abstain from the pollution of idols. Could you eat something that was sacrificed to idols? No. From fornication, could you gain, get involved in their orgies and their alcoholic binges and their fornication times so you could get a job or so, you know, you wouldn't have all this persecution coming against you? No. From things strangled from blood. They already had been told that these things were wrong and they should have absolutely nothing to do with it whatsoever. They weren't listening. They were following whatever they wanted to do. <laughs> you can't be doing that. What happens to these guys? They're in trouble, as we see. Someone who is not following the word, this is why you can't follow someone that says, I'm such and such. I don't care what they say. You better check it out. The one that says that I'm such and such. Well, 
only if you bring something in line with the word are we going to listen to you. If it's not in line with the word, which they should have known, they should have never followed it. Oh, but I'm a prophet. I got a special word from God for you, you know, because your situation, you know, it's okay to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit fornication. No. Anybody that comes along and thinks they have some word from the Lord and it's contrary to the word, no. They're hearing a false spirit, false Holy Spirit, a false doctrine, false devils. They're false prophets or false apostles or whatever they are. That's false. So that's what was happening here. They, were, they did, weren't checking things out in the word. What a mistake. He said, I gave her space to repent of her fornication. She repented not. God will always give people space to repent. He's not, he doesn't want judgment. He delights in mercy, not in judgment. But if you won't repent, the judgment will come. He gives space to repent. Remember with the Jews, 30 AD, Jesus sacrificed. That was it. There was no more reason for anything going on in the temple. Yet they continued, because they rejected the sacrifice of Jesus, they continued to offer up their sacrifices in the temple. God gave them space to repent. He sent all those ones in there. They were going in the synagogue, Peter and Paul and those ones, preaching the gospel to them. Call them to repentance. They wouldn't stop. 70 A.D. The time for the space to repent was over. And the judgment came. And the whole place was destroyed. God will give a person space to repent. But he expects them to do it. If they don't repent, judgment will come. <coughs> and look what he says. Behold, I'll cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Great tribulation. That talks about the end, doesn't it? Some people try to think that, oh, this is all historical and all passed away. It's already come to pass way back then. No. It's, there was those seven churches back then, but it's prophetic revelation of the end when the judgment comes. Because the great tribulation hasn't occurred yet. <laughs> uh, we know that from Matthew 24, verse uh, 21, where it says, Then shall be great tribulation, same words, same words in the Greek, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. It hadn't happened yet. So, all those ones that think that all this stuff already occurred and was already fulfilled in the first century, which some people are, they're called preterists. They're totally wrong, totally deceived. Missed the whole boat on everything. Don't listen to anybody that tries to tell you that these things aren't going to happen. She's going to cast into a great, bed, into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And these that commit adultery, what is adultery? Adultery is spiritual separation. It's not talking here about just a sexual thing. Spiritual adultery. Here's an example. It's in uh, James chapter 4. Notice what he calls these guys. You adulterers and adulteresses. You spiritual ones who spiritually separated yourself from me. Know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. We cannot be in, involved in the world. If we're involved with the world, we're a friend of the world. That's why the Bible says, be not conformed to the world, love not the things in the world. All that's in the world is not of the Father. You've got to stay away from it. We find too many people that have, are one foot in the world. The compromisers are in trouble. They cannot do this. Those that are in that spiritually separated state are going to be cast into great tribulation. They will not be protected in the times that will come. Revelation 2, 23, back here, back 22 still. Except they repent of their deeds, they have to change. Then he says, and I will kill her children with death. The children would be all the ones who are following her. And all the churches shall know, this is talking to the churches, they'll know that I am he which searches the reins in the hearts. What's the reins talking about? The reins is talking about the soul, the soulish realm, where there's the thoughts, feelings, purposes. 
and the heart. He searches the soul and the heart. He's looking for us to have a perfect heart. He's looking for our soul to be restored, healed, yielded unto the Lord, walk in His ways. And He says, I give unto every one of you according to your works. Notice it says He searches the reins in the heart. God searches. And we see the same thing when He's bringing judgment. He's going to search everybody. Psalm 7, verse 9. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just. For the righteous God trieth the hearts and the reins. He does. There'll be a time. The wicked, they're going to come to an end. They're going to be judged. The righteous, the just, are going to get established. They're going to be protected by the Lord. Psalms 26, verse 2. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins in my heart, he says. Try my soul and my heart. Examine me, test me, prove me. See whether I'm the real deal. Well, that's what God is going to do, of course. We see over in Jeremiah, chapter 11. Everybody's going to be tested. Jeremiah 11, 20. But, O Lord of hosts, that judgeth righteously, that triest the reins and the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them. That's the ones that do the evil things. It's going to happen. They're going to be say judgment. And unto thee have I revealed my cause. As God sees those who are walking right, they're going to be delivered and protected. The ones that aren't, there's going to be a vengeance that is going to come on them. We see a similar statement made in Jeremiah 20, verse 12. O Lord of hosts that tries the righteous, he will, and sees the reins in the heart. Let me see thy vengeance on them. For unto thee have I opened my cause. You and I need to walk in the ways of the Lord. Jeremiah 17, look at verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, the soul, to even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings or his deeds. What his works, all the things he's doing. That's why to every one of these, I know thy works, I know thy works, I know thy works. Your works show whether you're following the Lord or not. Come back to Revelation. Revelation 2. He says, I'm going to give everyone according to her works, your works. But I say unto you, and the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. You will know the depths of Satan if you compromise and go down false doctrine road. You'll be destroyed left and right. He says, I'm not going to put anything on you, no more other burden on you, because you guys have not walked after this false doctrine. But that which you have already, hold fast till I come. That's another important point. God wants us to hold fast to the things that he teaches us and that's been established in our life. We just don't learn some things and then let them go. No. We just don't do some things one minute and then it's not in our lifestyle after that. No. He wants us to incorporate everything that we're hearing and doing into our lifestyle. 2 Thessalonians 2.15 Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold or hold fast the traditions which you've been taught, whether by word or our epistle. He wants you not only to stand fast, but he wants you to hold on to the things that you've been taught from the word of God. Or to hold fast, whatever it might be. Even when God brings correction to you. We see it over in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 13. Take hold, fast hold of instruction. The word instruction means discipline, chastening, and correction. Don't reject it. Receive it, because it's getting you on the right path. Let her not go. Keep her, for she's thy life. The instruction, the discipline, the chastening, the correction, the things that God brings, is going to make sure that we're on the right path. What else are we to do? He wants you to hold fast the things that are good. Anything that's not good, get rid of it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. Prove, first, uh, prove all things, which means test and examine all things. Hold fast that which is good. You just hold, don't hold fast to whatever comes your way. 
you got to make sure, is this of the Lord or not? If not, get rid of it. It's no good. You want to have nothing to it. You only want to hold fast the thing that is good. And this is the word kalos, which means it's considered beautiful in the sight of the Lord because it's something that is good and holy before the Lord. What else does he want us to do? He wants you to hold fast to, as he says in 2 Timothy 1.13, hold fast the form of sound words. Remember, your words are important, and the words that you hear and get in your heart. Sound word, speech, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. He wants us to hold fast to these things. Again, we are not learning just to get some knowledge and then walk away and just walk in our own ways, go back to living in the flesh or the world or doing whatever we think is right in our sight. <laughs> no. That's what a lot of Christians do. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we, we're Christ's house, if, here's the condition, we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope, which is the confident expectancy, firm and stable unto the end. Otherwise, we hold fast everything. We hold fast the confidence in God, the rejoicing of this confident expectancy of all the things that he's promised to bring forth in our life. We see also we're to hold fast our confession. Why? Because that God, the Lord is per, 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 um, producing that in our life as he's confessing that before the Father and the angels. Hebrews 4.14, seeing then we have a great high priest pass in the heavens, Jesus the whole Son of God, hold fast our profession, which is speaking the word. God wants you to hold fast, speaking the word, praying the word, putting the word in operation, all the things that you're speaking into being continually. Hebrews 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. It's really hope. It's the word el peace in the Greek. Trans means translated hope everywhere, except for, unfortunately, here. We can prove that to you. 53 times it's translated hope. One time, erroneously, it's translated faith here. Who knows why they did that? Somebody was off track. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope, because the confession of your hope is your faith released. You speak your hopes into being, which is your faith released, without wavering, for he is faithful that promised, and he'll bring these things to pass. If we're to hold fast things, that's going to be important. You can't let things slip. And you'll see when we get to chapter 3, these guys let things slip, and they were in trouble. Hebrews 2, verse 1 even says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things we've heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Don't let anything slip. You want to hold fast to all these things. Everything. In fact, you'll see it when we get over to Revelation chapter 3, but we'll look at this one scripture. It's quite a statement. Revelation 3.11, he says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which you have, or you're having, that no man takes your crown. Not no man, it really means that no one. Nothing, nobody, nothing can take your crown. It means you could lose what you gain if you give place to the devil and you don't walk in the ways of the Lord. That means it's pretty important about holding fast. And then we come to one more thing before we conclude for tonight. He said, hold fast till I come. And then he says, and he that overcomes, which is the word conquer, the ka'o, to conquer and carry off the victory. And this is talking about you continually doing it, present tense, ongoing action. And keeping, this is you keeping, maintaining, present tense, my works unto the end, to him will I give authority, the word powers exousia, which means authority. Young's corrects the King James error. Authority over the nations. God wants you to conquer and carry off the victory. And we see that constantly, time after time. Well, you're going to have to conquer and carry off the victory. Don't think that you can't. You are able to do it. Look what Jesus said. He said in John 16, 33, These things have I spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. In the world 
you shall have tribulation pressure. We talked about the pressure coming against you and how you go through much pressure to enter into the kingdom. Be of good cheer. Be of good courage. I have conquered and carried off the victory over the world. Well, perfect tense, meaning he did it in the past with present results at the time of speaking. And what's that got to do with us? Well, he's on the inside of us. He will enable us to conquer and overcome, carry off the victory continually in our life with present effects continually in our life as well if we will do what needs to be done. And then we see the testimony down in 1 John chapter 2 when he talks about in verse 13 and 14 when he says, I write unto you fathers because you've known them from the beginning. I write unto you young men because you have conquered and carried off the victory over the wicked one. You, this guy could do it. And he was uh, what's considered a spiritual youth is the word in the Greek. He is conquering and carried off the victory. Verse 14 tells you how he did it. I write unto you fathers because you've known him from the beginning. I write unto you young men, you same one. How did they conquer them? Because you are strong and mighty. You and I are going to get strong and mighty through the word in us, full of power and manifesting might and strength. And the word of God abides in you, continually remaining in you. That's how it's going to happen. And you have conquered the wicked one. And this is the same one that was said about Jesus, perfect tense again. Just like Jesus said, I've conquered the world. He said, you have conquered in the past with present results the wicked one. You got rid of this enemy in your life. That's where we're headed to. And when you get him underfoot, it will be a present, ongoing action, a present result, the fact that he's defeated. You can defeat the enemy. And why can you do that? Because the greater one's on the inside of you. We sing that song. That'll be encouraging to you every time we sing it. 1 John 4, 4, You're of God, little children, and have overcome or conquered them, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You are able to conquer because of who's in you. The greater one's in you. You can conquer everything that would come against you. John 5, verse 4. Whatsoever is born of God, that's you and me, conquers the world. We're to conquer the world. And this is the victory that con oh, conquers the world, even our faith. That's why you've got to get your faith in operation. Get your mouth working. Hear the word, do it. Guard the word. Don't let the devil take it out of your heart so it doesn't produce anything. Make sure you keep your faith in operation. And this is going to be important because you've got to be a conqueror. I want you to notice this verse. And we want to comment on this for a second. Revelation 13, 7. This is talking about the Antichrist. It was given unto him, the Antichrist. To make, who gives him this? Does God give him to make war with the saints? No. The devil gives him to make war with the saints. That's who it's talking about. He's blaspheming God. He's speaking against him. And all these were worshiping the dragon, and the dragon gave the authority unto the beast. So, we come down to here. He gives, gives to this beast, this Antichrist, to make war with the saints and to conquer and overcome them. Does that mean that this is going to automatically happen? No, because it's the devil who gave that to him. So, we have authority over the devil. Just because the devil gave him authority doesn't mean that it has to happen. God's word still works in, uh, all along. The authority you have, the name of Jesus, the weapons of warfare, they work. This is not God giving him, him to him. A lot of people thought, oh, I thought this means that we're, he's going to overcome all, the, all of them. He's given to make war with the saints and to conquer them. That doesn't mean he can conquer them. Only if they don't use their authority and conquer the devil. You've got to learn to conquer the devil in your life. Otherwise, when he tries to come to conquer, you could get conquered. And authority was given him over all, the, all these. He's going to have this, and he's going to be able to conquer those who don't know how to conquer the devil. If you will conquer the devil, you will walk in victory. 
Revelation 21, verse 7. He says, He that overcomes or conquers and carries off the victory. And this is not, again, just once in a while. This is your life. Present tense. You are a conqueror. You are to conquer and carry off the victory day after day after day after day, situation after situation, regardless of what it is. Don't be moved by what you're still fighting against. Just keep conquering every day. You're on the way to victory. You're going to get there. Shall inherit all things. Hmm, that's everything that God has for us. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. God wants you to conquer and to carry off the victory in everything. That's tremendous. This is what he'll accomplish for us. But what, so what are we seeing? We've seen some important things. We've seen those guys that they deny the faith. If they deny him, they're going to get denied. But if they don't deny the faith, if they deny ungodliness, they walk in his ways, then they're going to get a crown of life. They've got to show themselves to be faithful. Doctrine's important. These guys were following false doctrine. They were in compromise. Can you be in compromise in your life and see God's blessings? No. We cannot compromise. It doesn't matter what the situation is. Your doctrine is important, as we see. You need to hate the things that God hates and love the things that He loves. He wants you to walk in love towards Him and towards everybody. He wants you to serve Him and carry out the ministry that He's called for you. He's given you the faith of Jesus. He wants you to use your faith that you live by, walk by, and overcome and conquer every enemy. The victory that overcomes the world is your faith. You have a general spirit of faith. It is to grow exceedingly. God wants you to become full of faith and have your faith so strong that the power of God is working through you mightily and you increase greatly. At the same time, Make sure you don't listen to anybody. I don't care who they say they are, if they say they're a prophetess or whatever. If they're any time telling you to do anything contrary to the Word of God, and you think, well, I have to do that in order to compromise, in order to function. That's nuts, you know, that's wrong. Like the guy that says, well, I, ha I can't tithe, you know. Well, <laughs> get ready for curses to come upon you. <laughs> you're going to need to tithe. If you're not a tither, you're going to get cursed. I don't care what your situation is. God wants us to do what he says. What happened? Compromisers will get in the great tribulation. Ones that are spiritual adulterers in the world will get in the great tribulation. They're going to be in trouble. God searches the hearts and the soul to find out who's going to walk in his ways and who is not. He's looking for you and I to hold fast the traditions, our confession, what's good, sound words, confidence. Hold fast, not let anything slip. And you and I are to be conquerors and carry off the victory over the devil, over the world, the greater ones in you, you're well able to overcome, and you have the tremendous promise that if you conquer and overcome continually, you'll inherit all things, and God will be your God, and you will be his son, his child. Praise God. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the word of God that brings revelation of what God is looking at when he's speaking of the judgment, I see the things to be established in my life. I will be a doer of the word and see them flourish. I see the things which I must avoid. I cannot compromise. I cannot have false doctrine. I can't be following people that say they're something and they're not and would deceive me. I can only follow that which is in line with the word. I know the Lord searches the hearts and the soul and he's expecting me to hold fast to everything I've learned and to walk in it and to conquer every enemy, conquer the world, walk in his ways. The greater one's in me because he's in me. I can conquer everything that comes against me. Thank you, Lord. I will pass the test. I will not see the judgment. Instead, I will be the overcomer, the conqueror that carries off the victory, that sees all the blessings come forth in my life. In Jesus' name, amen.
Praise God. We're continuing on this, and we're going to continue on this on Sunday. Father, we thank you that we are taking heed to these important things, seeing what's required and what's necessary, at the same time seeing the mistakes that were made and the things that brought judgment. We thank you that we are going to make sure we're walking the way of the Lord so that we can see our, not only to be protected and escape the things that are going to come, but also to see the rewards that you promised for those who conquer and carry off the victory. Thank you for much fruit as we hear and do this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Next we're going to talk about...